Father, I am just amazed at the wonders that you've created across the universe and the things that we can see with our eyes and the things we can't see. It's just amazing that you love us enough to send your Son to die for us. Father, and that you want us to come and to worship you, and that's what we're doing this morning. As we join our hearts together, Lord, I just pray that you just bless our time. And Father, I pray that we're a blessing to you. I just pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's your name. The mountains shake and crumble. It's your name. The oceans roar and tumble. It's your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, the people cry out, the Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord, let's sing that again, Lord of all the earth. And Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Your name, the morning breaks in glory. In your name, I love this, creation sings your story, yeah, at your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out, and Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with Endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Sing it again. And Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, shaking up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. No one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God, we sing, we sing. There's no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God, we will sing, we sing. There's no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. Jesus, you are God, we will Lord of all the earth, and Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. And Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Who am I that the highest king would well? I was lost, I was lost, me and oh his love for me, oh his love for me, the sun sets free, oh it's free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes I am, free at last. Free at last, he 
his ransom me, oh, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am in my Father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Let's sing that one more time. Sing it like you mean it. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. So I'm by myself up here. I've got no band, so pretend there's a band playing really soft while I read this to you. It's from Ephesians chapter 2. You hear the band? It's beautiful. Great job, guys. All right. So Ephesians chapter 2 starts off that we're dead in our trespasses, right? And there's all kinds of this stuff, and we get to this amazing, amazing two words that says, but God. Everyone say that, but God, right on. But God, who didn't allow me to be able to read without my glasses. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved or lavished upon us. Oh, I love that. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ For good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Amen. Who said amen? Say that amen. Amen again. Because God is mighty to save. Jesus, God's hand is not too short to save, right? Jesus' death on the cross is enough for our salvation. When he said it's finished, he meant it. He says it is finished. For each and every one of us, it is finished. And what is it that God gets out of it? He gets all the glory. But what do we get out of it? I mean, I mean, that's enough. God's God getting the glory is is enough. But what do we get out of it? We sit in heavenly places. And how many of us walk like we're not seated in heavenly places? He said, We sit. We're already there. Let me say that again. We're already there. It is finished. We're already there. We're seated in heavenly places. We're seated there. When we come together and we worship, we ask Jesus to be present. The Holy Spirit comes into this room as we worship and we praise. He says, let me show you a little glimpse of what it feels like to sit in heavenly places. Welcome to my throne room. And so as we 
we sing this, and it's not because of us. It's not because of what we can do and what we can pull off in this veneer of humanness that we present to the rest of the world. It's not because of anything that we've done, but it's everything about what Christ has done. Not only on the cross, but conquering death and taking a seat at the right hand of the Father, all of those things, it all points to his work. And we are part of that workmanship, and what an honor and a privilege. And how humbling it is that we start out as dead human beings, dead in our trespasses, and we are made alive in Christ. And he is mighty to save. And we, there's not a large enough stage to say that from. There's not a big enough guitar to strum. We can't say that loud enough. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. We sing, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Yeah. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. I surrender. Yes, we surrender, Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, after a salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine the light in, let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Shine the light in, let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. We sing, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. We sing, Savior, He can move the mountains. God is mighty. So, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that it was finished. We thank you, God, that our mistakes are left and covered on that cross. God, we recognize that our sin did not go unpunished, and our sin continues to not go unpunished, but you laid all of that upon Christ. God, we're humbled by that. God, we don't take it lightly. We're grateful. We, we, we sing to you. God, we thank you for restoring our relationship, for keeping your promise, for being mighty to save. That our sin is separated from us as far as the east is from the west. We thank you for our salvation. And we praise you and we thank you this morning. And the whole church said, amen. You may be seated. Children, come on up.
You guys are like slow motion today. I am just going to throw some of these out there, and I want everyone to get one. Okay? Ah. Just want one. Okay? Did everybody get one? I think everybody got it. Ah. There's, a, there's another one. These others, Patty, can you... Help me because I can't do it with things. All right. How's everybody doing today? You everybody got a, a thing? All right. Let me see that. I brought the garbage can because we're going to use it in a minute, I think. How strong are you? Can you break it? Anyone not able to break it? You can't break it? You're not that strong? Can you break it? Okay, if you break it, I want you to throw it in the trash. I didn't mean, well, I guess I did say throw it. <laughs> Here. Throw it. Throw it, throw it, throw it, throw it, throw it. Some of you are um, not very good. All right. These, don't do anything with these. Take one bundle each. How do you like how I'm passing those out? Who needs one? There's another one. I was trying to decide, how many do I make? You only need one. You need one more back there? One there. One there. How many kids we got? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen. That's great. There's one. All right, everybody have one? Okay, I want you to think, how easy was it to break one? Not that hard. I taped three together. I want you to break it. You got it? Did you break it? Good. You broke it? You got to untape it? No, don't untape it. Okay. Anyone not able to break it? You can't break it? You can't break it? Is it harder? What if I would have done six? You got it? What if I had to, what if I had to put six together? Could you do that? That would be probably you'd be harder. So here's... All right. If you didn't break it, you can keep it or you can throw it in the trash. Your choice. If you broke it, throw it in the trash. I don't want you to stab yourself with the splinters there. If you didn't break it, if you want to give it back to me, you can throw it in the trash too and I'll take it out later. Okay? You got it? Good. All right. It's possible to break three. It was real easy to break one. Okay? Here, what do you think my Bible verse is? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. It says, this is uh, King Solomon. He says, And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So here's the deal. One stick was really easy to break. Three was harder. Okay? Now listen. So what this verse is trying to tell us is it's really important to have 
friends. It's really important to have Christian friends. It's really important to worship together. Because if you do everything alone, it's real easy to get discouraged. It's real easy to give up. But if you have someone walking beside you, they can help you. In fact, a couple verses before that, it says, if someone falls down, there's someone there that can help pick them up. We need people that can help pick us up. So one stick was really easy. Three's harder. If I gave you 10, it'd be pretty tough to break. Okay, let's pray. Father, help us to understand how important it is to have Christian friends. Help us to understand how important it is to walk beside someone so that if we fall or they fall, we're there to pick each other up. Father, thank you for walking with us because even alone, you're there and you can help us. Father, I pray that we have at least that three chords so that we can stand together. For its name in Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ted. You know, when the kids were really little, um, we as a family, we went to Legoland in San Diego. Uh, Jen got some kind of a discount that we were able to use, and it was just a fun day. An amusement park based upon a little plastic toy that's absolute murder when you step on it in the middle of the night. Who knew (laughs) it could be that much fun of an amusement park? And so I was thinking, and the reason I, and this occurs to me is because we were going through scrapbooks here recently and we were remembering how much fun it was and, and all the little uh, family moments we had. And it's like, you know, Natalie is in her last year of school. She's going to be graduating next uh, spring. And what if we just, as one final big family hurrah, maybe we should go back to... San Diego, back to Legoland. That just sounds like that would be good. But no no discounted thing this time. This is a big deal because it's our last final family hurrah. So let's just go all out. You know, no no discount. Um, we're, we're going to uh, do like that hotel park hopper deal to where you like stay in the castle and you go to the amusement park and the water park and the sea life park and uh and i'm I, i'm, I'm going to add like the vip treatment to everybody you know to where they just roll out the red carpet to where they like park your car for you and i was looking this up you can get like a souvenir cup for everybody and you can have souvenir photos for everybody and you get to all you can eat inside the park with at all the fancy restaurants that normally we don't get to eat but we would do now and you get your own uh tour guide that shows you all the highlights of, of Legoland Park and gets you like priority uh, on the ride so that you can be sure not to miss out on anything. And it even comes with like a little cabana that you can have at the hotel swimming pool that nobody else has. I mean, we're just going to go all out. And I looked up the package. And if I get the tickets that are non-refundable and non-transferable, it's only about $8,000. <laughs> Now, I've actually paid way less than that for pretty much all my cars. But still, this is a, this is a huge last family hurrah. So, like, it's totally worth it. Now, first of all, you know I'm kidding, right? <laughs> I mean, there's, there are just so many things that I would rather do with $8,000 than two days at an amusement park of the People's Republic of California. But it's an illustration... <laughs> I'm trying to make a point, so you just got to go with me here, 
uh, I'm making a point. So $8,000, non-transferable, non-refundable tickets that I can buy now, reserve now, for a trip that we're going to take in the spring. Now, let's just say for my happy little illustration that I have one or two of the kids that between then and now, for some reason, they just really develop this attitude. You know, I don't, they, they just get really rebellious. They, 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 they fight against their homework. They fight against their chores. They really start acting rebellious in church and just, ah, ah, and they're done. just nothing seems to be swaying them uh, to get back on to where they need to be in their relationship with me, their relationship with their siblings, their relationship uh, with God and their church, and just doesn't seem to be fixed. So how bad do they have to be before I say, after I reserve these non-refundable, non-transferable tickets, how much, how bad do they have to get before I finally say, you know what, forget the trip. I'm canceling it. $8,000, I will just consider that to be a loss. I will just consider that to be a complete waste of my money because I cannot imagine going on a trip with you. How, how bad would they have to be? To which you're like, Fred, what are you talking about? Just take that one kid, park that one kid with grandma, and everybody else go on the trip. <laughs> it's like, okay, how bad does that one kid have to be before I say the $1,300 I spent on just you, I'm willing to consider it a complete loss and a complete waste, and I'm just going to trash it because I cannot imagine going on that kind of a trip with you. How bad would he have, how bad would that kid have to be? See, I'm thinking about non-refundable, non-transferable tickets, Aside from them doing something that puts them into juvenile detention or prison to where the state says that they can't go, they're going on that trip. <laughs> I, I, I'm $1,300, that's too much for me just to consider that to be a loss and a waste. I'm not going to do that. They're going to go on that trip. There's too many other things at my disposal that I can do. I have too much other leverage in my life to where I can do some discipline and to try to correct them onto a new path to where that trip is not what they're going to lose out on. Not to mention the fact that this is our final family big hurrah. I mean, how bad do they have to be before I say, you know what? We are not going to include you as a family member on our final big family hurrah that we do together. There's nothing. I, I honestly can't think of anything. Here's a little bit of a summary of what I'm saying. This is on the screen so you can see it. Why no Harris will be left behind? Why, nobody's going to be standing on the freeway saying Lego land or bust. <laughs> Number one, their passage has been bought and paid for with money that's too valuable to waste. And I'm just not willing to cut them out of an important family experience because they're still my kid. And I'm committed to them as their dad, even when they drive me nuts. Now, let's take that happy little knowledge and transfer it over to our relationship with God. How much did God have to pay in order to adopt me? What, what was the cost to adopt me and bring me into his family to where I can live a part of his family and a part of his kingdom forever? It cost Jesus' life. So how bad do I have to be before God says, you know what? I paid my son's life for this, but I'm just willing to say that's a waste. That's a loss. I'm willing to take the loss because I just cannot imagine eternity with Fred Harris when he acts like this. How much did God value Jesus' life 
when he died on the cross. A whole lot more than I would value a measly 1300 bucks in comparison, right? And if Jesus was willing, and God was willing, God the Father was willing to pay Jesus' life in order to buy that kind of ticket that, by the way, is non refundable. It's not like there's any way that Jesus is going to go back in time and undie for me. And it's also non transferable. We're going to get into this as we continue on in Romans. But Paul's gospel presentation is not the idea that Jesus bought salvation and he just throws it out there to see if anybody will take it. The way that Paul defines the gospel is God specifically picked people out to save them by name and then he paid Jesus' blood to save them. So he died for me specifically he didn't die for me potentially of, hey, anybody, anybody want to take me up on the offer uh, with there being the possibility that with us being dirty, rotten sinners, nobody would take him up on the offer? He died in such a way to where he saved me as one of his chosen specifically. And I cannot transfer that salvation to anybody else even if I wanted to. Paul says that he wished he could. You know, and when we get to it someday in, in Romans chapter 9, he says, you know what? I'd be willing to give up my salvation for the sake of my fellow Jews. But he knew he couldn't because the salvation is non-transferable. It was for me. And I can't give it away. And so how much, how badly did God want to adopt me into his family, bring me into his kingdom, Bring me along on this family trip that he would be willing to pay Jesus' blood. And what would he be willing to do to say, you know what, Fred is so bad, I'm just going to give up on that desire. That was my goal. That was my idea that I had from the beginning of time before I created that first tree. But I didn't know how bad Fred was going to be. And so I'm just going to give up on that dream and flush Jesus' blood. How bad would I have to be? Here's clarifying what I'm trying to say. Why no child of God will be left behind. Our adoption cost was just too valuable for him to waste. And he's not willing to cut us out of his family experience because we're still his kids and he's committed to us as our dad. Now, this is what I want you to hang on to. When it came to whichever one of my kids was acting up so much, and I decide you are going on that trip no matter what, you notice that their coming on to the trip depended very heavily upon me. It was my decision. My desires, my priorities, and it had very little to do with what they did. Because no matter what they did, they were going on the trip. And in the same way, when God says, I am hanging on to you. Me, who begins your faith, I'm faithful to complete it. That God says, that this is really largely dependent upon me. My decisions, my desires, my perspective, not really yours, because no matter what you do, I'm hanging on to you. Jesus' blood was just too valuable for me. And this is where we're headed today. Do you know what that means? That means is when I'm looking for... How do I know that I'm going to be able to cross the finish line? How do I know that I'm going to be able to persevere in spite of all those temptations out there that are trying to drag me down and lure me away? How do I know that I'm going to have this eternal relationship with God to where he's never going to let me go? It is not dependent upon how faithful I am to God. It's not even entirely dependent upon how faithful God is to me. It's how faithful is God to himself. Because he has a desire. My name is on it. And nothing can change his mind. Let's pray, then we're going to get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, we've already sung about it. 
Ted's already talked about it. This salvation defined as freedom, as joy, as a whole new relationship where we're not coming to you as our God to where we're, you're the drill sergeant in the sky and we're absolutely terrified all the time that if we mess up, you're just going to make us drop and give you push-ups. We're family now. You love us as our dad. You've committed yourself to us as our dad and you paid an incredibly expensive adoption price to make it happen. And so, God, this morning, I pray that when we come to you and we have all these thoughts of whether or not we're obeying, whether or not we're being faithful, I pray that you put it in the right parameters and the right mindset. Now, what's at stake here is our joy in our relationship with you, the joy that we have in following you, and what's not at stake is whether or not you're willing to leave us behind, standing on the freeway holding a sign while you take all your faithful children to live in your house. Speak to us, God. You're already speaking. I'm already hearing you. But I pray that you open up our hearts and open up our minds to all we embrace it this morning. Live in the overwhelming joy and praise of it in a way that is freedom and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. On Sunday mornings, we have entered into, for a while now, the study of the first eight chapters of Romans. And so far, all we've really covered is the first three chapters that I've entitled, Why We Were All in Trouble, right? And the first chapters, one and two, were more specific issues of what we deal with um, as people. Just because we were born with these sinful natures, here's some specific reasons why God pours out so much wrath on us. But just in case any of us were feeling pretty safe with Romans chapters 1 and 2, then he does a much more general statement in Romans chapter 3, this very long statement that says, "Uh uh-oh, you guys are all bad. You're all evil. There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who does good. There's no one who seeks God. There's no one who fears God. All have turned away. All have become worthless for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all in trouble. But in the midst of this little section of we are all in trouble, in the first eight verses of chapter three that we're going to read in a second, Paul kind of takes it a little bit of a detour. And it almost doesn't seem to flow, but you get the idea that as he's writing, he's imagining all these, all these opponents lifting, uh, raising up all these objections to everything that he's saying. So he decides to address the objections uh, and then answer them right away. And it's a rhetorical, brilliant stroke on his mind, on, on his part, uh, because he's able to address the objections before the objectors even have a chance to voice them before they have a chance to spread all this stuff about what a, what a loony bin Paul is, um, and Paul's already answering their questions. And so what he does is he comes up with four questions that he knows that people are going to be asking in response to his letter. And we're going to look at those, uh, the first question, the third, and the fourth question. We're not going to hit real hard. It's not our main point today, um, but they're there, so we're going to talk about them. I really want to talk about and hang on to Question number two. But just to get into it, uh, let's read it. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And this is what he says at the very beginning, right before he levels this general thing of we're all in trouble. What advantage has the Jew? What is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, 
Their condemnation is just. All right, four questions Paul wants to address. Here's question number one. Go ahead, Jay. Questions from Paul's imaginary opposition. Question number one. What good does it do to be a Jew if Romans 2 is true? What good does it do to be a Jew, a genetic, ethnic, nationality Jew, if Romans 2 is true? Now, in order to address that question, we really kind of need to remember what his argument was in Romans 2 that got the Jewish people so angry at him in the first place to where they were willing to hunt him down, try to arrest him, maybe even kill him. So if we can go back to Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 29. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So he says this. Did you catch what he was saying? Here's a little bit of a summary of what Paul said that just made the Jews want to take away Paul's favorite Jew award. Number one, Paul claimed that the outward sign of circumcision didn't do any good. The sign of circumcision, you know, in the Old Testament, this is what God gave Abraham. He's like, this is how I want people to know that you're my chosen guy. And you got to circumcise all your descendants so that way people will know that your people are my chosen people. So Paul is coming out and saying, the sign of circumcision that the Jewish people valued so much because it set them apart from everybody else, it didn't do any good if somebody was going to break God's law. And that's really bad news because in chapter 3, he starts describing how everybody was going to be a lawbreaker. In other words, then, circumcision doesn't do anyone any good. You imagine a Jew hearing this? Or some poor Gentile guy who converts to Judaism, and he's like a 45-year-old that gets circumcised. He's like, are you kidding me? Why didn't you tell me that like a month ago before I converted? But here's the second thing that he says that they just would have really been angry at. They would have not really liked that first one. This one's even worse. One can't call himself a Jew if he's only circumcised outwardly. A true Jew is one whose heart is circumcised by the Holy Spirit. Now, the way Paul is going to defend this later in a chapter that we're not going to get to yet, and it's chapter 9, is he brings up Esau. Esau was a descendant of Abraham. Esau was circumcised, but Esau was not a Jew because God had not circumcised his heart. At the same time, you have these other people. Caleb, the mighty Kenite, who is more faithful than the rest of the Jews in the wilderness, and he says, hey God, if you want me to go uphill and fight giants, I will because I trust in you. And he becomes one of Judaism's heroes. He was not a Jew. He was a convert. That God said, you're the true Jew because I've gotten a hold of your heart. You have Rahab, the Canaanite, Ruth, the Moabite, same thing. Heroes of the faith, but they're not Jews. But God made them Jews. They became part of the Jewish people, and they even became Jewish heroes because God had gotten a hold of their heart. So you look at that with number two, and it's like that totally makes sense. A Jew is not a Jew because of their family tree. A Jew is not a Jew because they went through some kind of a physical ceremony that they had nothing to do with when they were a baby. A Jew is a true Jew if God gets a hold of their heart. That makes sense. But now so does also their question. Well, what good is there then to being the genetic, ethnic Jew? 
What's the point then of the entire Old Testament where God builds us up as a mighty nation if it really doesn't matter in the long run? If anybody can be a Jew just by having the right faith, what does it matter? And here is Paul's answer. Go ahead, Jack. Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What's the point? Why are they so valuable? What gives them as a nation intrinsic value? Paul's basically saying, are you kidding me? All the scripture that we have in Paul's day, this is all the Old Testament. That's what oracles of God is. It's the word of God. The scripture, all the scripture that we have, we have only because of the Jews. They came up with all of it. God used them to write it. God used them to teach it. God used them to preserve it. And what would we have if we did not have the Jews preserving, being given the oracles of God in order to share with the world? How do you know that your life has this incredible, invaluable price tag on it of being made in God's image as opposed to you just coming about by random acts of chance? How do you know that? Because a Jew was inspired by God to preserve for us the creation story so that you know you have worth just by you being a human being. When our society is being torn apart with all this mamby pamby relativistic, pluralistic morality, how do we know God's firm foundation of, no, this is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is evil, this is black, and this is white. Don't move from this. How do we know that? Because God inspired a Jew to preserve for us his law of what he hates and what he loves and what he expects. When everybody else is redefining for us words like grace and mercy and love, these Jews were inspired by God to come up with these prophecies about this Messiah who is going to come and show us what they really mean. All these prophecies about who this Messiah was going to be, what he was going to do, what he was going to accomplish. Jesus wouldn't have made sense to us if we didn't have the Old Testament prophecies telling us why he came. From the Jews, we get how God likes to be worshipped. From the Jews, we get the idea of what Jesus is talking about when he starts talking about the kingdom of God has come to you. The Jews are where we get all that. Paul's like, are you kidding me? You guys are going to be remembered for all eternity. And you are the ones that God used to inspire, to write, to teach, to preserve the scriptures that tell us everything we need to know about who God is, who we are, what salvation is, and how to get there. Came from the Jews. Paul's like, you are always going to be in honored position just for that all by itself. Now we're actually going to skip number two. And we're going to go to question number three, four. And they're kind of the same question, so I pile them up together. If our evil acts, if our evil acts as the dark backdrop to show off the light of God's goodness, doesn't that make our being evil a good thing? Why would he judge us for it? And why shouldn't we keep doing it? If my unrighteousness makes God's righteousness look better, that's a good thing. So why would he start judging me for being so unrighteous? And Paul kind of breaks down his answer into two. Here's answer number one. If God didn't judge us when we were evil, how could he judge the world? See, the fact of the matter is he really is a righteous God. And him being righteous means he is a perfect judge. If he weren't the perfect judge, how would he have the right to judge absolutely the whole world? But he is the perfect judge. And because he's the perfect judge, he cannot let anything go. I don't care what the movies say. I say that because I always pick on these two characters. And, and it's getting older, so now I'm just showing that I don't watch a lot of movies anymore. But they just stick in my head because they actually preach this in their movies. But Harry Potter... Captain Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean. Both of them write their own rules. They're breaking the rules all the time. They're doing what's wrong, but their stories always turn out so good to where they end up being the hero. 
I mean, they're doing wrong in order that good will result and we applaud and we cheer and we buy the little action figures, but not God. God's like, I don't care if it turns out good. The fact of the matter is, just because I miraculously work all things together for the good of those who love me, that doesn't mean that what you did was good. And I'm the perfect judge. I got to judge that. I'm not going to let that go because I'm earning the right to judge the whole world. And you're like, well, Fred, you know, right, that Harry Potter and Captain Jack Sparrow, you know they're not real. <laughs> you know, and those are just movies. Okay, well, let's bring up some real instances that we have in the Bible. Rahab the Canaanite lies in order to protect a couple of Jewish spies. Pharaoh's midwives, they lie in order to protect babies from getting killed and thrown into the Nile River. They were all pagans. They were Gentile pagans who had worshipped other gods, but they came to this decision that we want to worship the true God. We fear the true God. We want to follow the true God. So we're willing to lie in order to follow the true God. Now, the Bible commends them for coming up with the conclusion that we want to follow the true God and we want to fear him and worship him. The Bible never commends them for lying. As a matter of fact, Jesus had to die because they lied. Understand that? How big of a deal their lie was? The creator of the universe had to give up his life because they lied. He is the perfect judge and his justice is absolute. In his role as the perfect judge, he is unbribable. He is unswayable by the situation. He is unbendable. I've heard a preacher on TV say that God was willing to give up his justice for the sake of his love. Jesus had to die a horrible death because God was not willing to give up his justice for the sake of his love. He has to be just. He cannot sway from that. He can't deviate from that just a little bit. And just because he's able to miraculously turn your evil into something that's good by working it out for the good because he's that kind of a powerful God that doesn't make our evil into something that's good and that's also the second thing that the the question that Paul was asking shouldn't we keep doing it well if my evil accomplishes good shouldn't I just keep doing that evil then and Paul basically says oh my word you so deserve to go to hell (laughs) this is how he says it Go ahead, Jack. Your condemnation is just. <laughs> oh, man, when God throws you into hell, I totally get it. <laughs> because you just, that's something that somebody who's going to hell would say. Just because God works all things out according to his plan and according to his purpose, the good, the bad, and the ugly, that doesn't make everything okay. And Christians don't talk that way. Christians know that bad is bad. And they don't want to be bad anymore. And they know the Holy Spirit is inside of them, giving them all the power that they need to escape the bad. So they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, please save me from this. Who can deliver me from this body of death? I know you can. Save me from this. And they're not looking for more excuses of, well, God's going to turn it out okay in the end anyway, so I might as well just keep doing what I want. That's not the way Christians are supposed to talk. All right. Now, why those two questions? It's because of what he said with question number two. Here's question number two. Does our unfaithfulness mess up the faithfulness of God? See, the Jews were given all these oracles, all this scripture that some of the Jews really didn't believe. Even it was coming from their people. They didn't really believe it. They were really rejecting it. As a matter of fact, most of them rejected it. So was their unfaithfulness, did that undo the faithfulness of God to them? When they're rejecting him, rebelling against him, did that make God prompt just to say, you know what, I am so done with the Jews. 
They have never believed in me. They've never followed me. All the way back to where they were in Egypt, they were already worshiping idols and they never got any better according to Ezekiel. So are they just done? Was God just done with the Jews? He talks about a divorce in the book of Jeremiah. Was that then the end of God's relationship with the Jewish people, ethnic Jewish people? Here's Paul's answer. By no means. Let God be true though every man were a liar. Even if every single person in the world were a liar, which we are, God's not. God is always going to be true to the promises that he gave to the ethnic Jews. Turn with me to, well, actually, don't just look on the screen. In the interest of time, I wrote it down for you. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob. All the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you. I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Keep that on the screen just for a little bit, Jack. The Jews were so unfaithful. But even though every single person were a liar, God is going to stay true to his word, to his promise that he made to the Jewish people. Now, now Fred, when you say Jewish people, though, are you talking about the ones who have the right bloodline of Jewish people, or are you talking about the Romans to Jewish people, to where we're all spiritually children of Abraham because we have the right faith and our hearts have been circumcised? Which one are you talking about here? When you say that this is a promise made specifically to them, and not necessarily to all of us who are Gentiles, why, why is that? I don't have time to get into it. Really, Paul is going to talk about that a lot in Romans chapter 9 through 11, and we'll study it a lot. Suffice it to say, here, I think he's just talking to the ethnic Jews, and this is why I think that. It's because he directed this promise towards you descendants of Jacob. He didn't say you descendants of Abraham. Maybe I'm splitting hairs here. But you know, you read the Old Testament account of God, conversations with Abraham and God's conversation with Jacob, he told Abraham, I am going to make you the father of a multitude of nations. Lots of different people groups are going to call you their spiritual dad. He never said that to Jacob. In the New Testament, I am called the child of Abraham as long as I have the right faith. I'm never called the child of Jacob. So here's maybe a little bit of Fred theory. I think this is talking specifically to the ethnic Jews, giving them a promise that God is not willing to give up, even though as a people they have rejected him. Even though they are unfaithful, God is going to be faithful because he's faithful to himself. He is going to show that even though every man were a liar, I am the one that keeps my promise. I'm the one that's just and keep to my word. And what was the promise? It's a promise, first of all, to a remnant, which means that nobody can take confidence in the fact, well, I'm a Jew, so I'm okay. I have the right family tree. I must be okay. God never made a promise to every single Jew. He made a promise to the remnant of the Jews. He's preserving for himself. And you read that, and the promise is, I'm the one that brought you up. I'm the one that's going to sustain you. I'm the one that's going to rescue you. And I don't think necessarily we can say automatically that carries over to us because we're not descendants of Jacob. Saying that, I do get great confidence from that because I do worship that God. Even if that wasn't worded with Fred Harris as the recipient, as a direct recipient, I still worship that God and he still believes the same thing about me. Even if Fred Harris were proved a liar, God's still going to keep his promise to me. And his promise is, I sure paid a lot to adopt you into my family. I sure paid a huge price to bring you to be a part of my kingdom. I sure want badly for you to be part of my family and part of my kingdom. It's my desire. 
I've already paid for it. It's already finished, Randy said. Even if you're a liar, I'm not. I'm going to keep my word. Even if you're unfaithful, I'm not. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be faithful to me. Nobody changes my mind. Nobody takes away from me what I really want. And I want you. When you're one of mine, I want you. And there's nothing that you can do to get away from me. I take great comfort for that. I find great peace in that. Especially when I'm in the midst of really screwing up. And that guilt starts weighing heavily again. And I start wondering all over again, why does God even put up with me? I take great confidence in the fact that God is never going to disappoint himself. He's faithful to himself, and he always gets his way. And I praise him for that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, even though every one of us were proved to be a liar, you're not. You keep your promises. And I hang on to that for all I'm worth. God, if there is anybody in here that has been written before you created that first tree, been written on the list of people that you're going to save, God, I pray this day be the day when their eyes are open, their hearts are exchanged for new hearts, their minds are exchanged for new minds to where they can see and understand who you really are, how much you really love them, the price that you already paid and where they can get their confidence. We love you, God, so much. The truth of the gospel blows us away. It is amazing. I pray that we rest in it. I pray that we enjoy it. In Jesus' name, amen.